Raptors, 15 and 20. Man, this is great. Jalen, you just made my night. I don't, I don't know if you know it, but uh, you really just made my night, man. Uh, making an offer on a four unit, going big. Yeah, man. Oh, that's, I'm talking about. that's awesome. That is awesome. Hey, guys, on Facebook, we're live. We are in the Wealth of Real Estate Facebook group. I'm glad y'all jumped on tonight. If you're not in the room, you can hit the events link or just look at the feed and click the Zoom link. We'd love to have you in the room tonight. Uh, we just talk real estate on Monday nights. Nothing formal. We just talk a little bit about the business that we're doing, share ideas with each other, and, and try to grow. So glad to have you watching us on Facebook. But if you want to jump in the room, interact, jump in the room. I see Andy, Ramon, Andre, Jaron, Jalen, Paul, hey, Paul, Samir, all in the room tonight. Jalen just made an offer on a four unit. I don't want him to draw too much attention to it yet because he, 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 I don't want to create any competition. Uh, but I'm really excited about that, man. Uh, just, just, just excited about it. Is it, and it's all rented up. Is it in an area where you'd like to stay, Jalen? Yes, it's in uh, in Lee County. So, okay, good deal. Good deal. I have to get some details from you so after you get this contract accepted here. All right. Uh, man, this is great. Just seeing where the market is going and seeing seeing you make make do your first multifamily. It'll be it'll be awesome. So, hey, uh, I'm gonna open up the floor tonight uh, to uh, folks sharing their deal, sharing something you have going on. If you have something you're looking for, uh, gonna open up the floor tonight. Uh, very, very, very interested in hearing how's it, how everybody's doing. Uh, so, Samir, I know you've got a deal you're working. If you, if you could open us up. Just tell us a little bit about what you've got going on. Yeah, for sure. So, um, working on a deal in Cleveland. It's a small multifamily. Um, and it kind of came to me because I uh, had a friend I met two years ago. And I don't know anything about Cleveland, but he's active in Cleveland <laughs> And he actually brought the deal my way and said he wanted to work on it together. So, um, you know, we submitted an offer and seller accepted, you know, so we're, we're under contract right now. We're actually heading there tomorrow to go do walkthroughs and inspections. So, yeah. How many, how many units? I can see the excitement all over your face. <laughs> yeah, submitting a lot of offers, right? You, you guys know how it is. <laughs> yeah. um, six units, right? So nothing huge in that way, but a step in the right direction. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's, I mean, that's big. How do you find the comfort to invest out of state, like in a new market? Yeah. So I think that I've been doing that for the last two years. So I started off by investing in Memphis and Oklahoma city. Uh, so I got a little familiar with it, but, um, really it's, it's a big jump. I would say at least in terms of trust and control, right? Because having things in your backyard is nice. You can go out when you need or take care of things, but when they're thousands of miles away, you have to kind of make sure you have good people there you can trust and relinquish some control, if you will. Absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, good people you can trust helps mitigate your risk, but also just gives you a little bit more peace of mind. Definitely. Definitely. Having a great you know, property manager helps as well. I would say that's been for us the number one person that's helped make it happen. How can you tell like if somebody's going to be a great property manager when you're going into a new market? Um, I think it goes for a lot of things, right? It's just uh, referrals, seeing who other people have referred, worked with, have had positive things to say. Um, that's kind of how we found property managers, just contractors, realtors, the whole team in that way, really. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. Anybody got any questions for Samir? Um, love, love, love your doing deals. Like I got a question. Yeah. When he uh when you're evaluating your uh deal on your multifamily, do you use the one percent or two percent uh to calculate like what you would sell for rent? But that's what I need. Um so I kind of use that as a quick test, but then you still have to underwrite, you know, per market because some markets have different expenses than others. So the one percent is a good, I think, way to just quickly determine, but not the be all say all. So, for example, Ohio has really high property taxes. I mean, not high compared to Texas, but still relatively high. Um, 
So that's, you know, maybe skews things in that way. So one person might not be enough, right? Um, again, gen general statement, but yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Jalen, would you have a property management company manage this one you're buying or how, how would you manage this one that you're buying if, if it comes through? I was going to try it out on my own, but I'm definitely going to talk to you about it once I get everything going, see the best option to do. Yeah. Yeah. What's been your decision making process, Ramon? Like, I know, I know you talk to property management companies. I think you have a goal of eventually having all of your stuff with property management. How, how are you like evolving on that idea? What do you think, Ramon? On, on a, Cause you self manage your stuff right now, I think. So what's your thought process like on that? Yeah, I think it just kind of plays to my stress level too. Uh, if I get to where, you know, I feel like I'm, I'm like doing too much, you know, taking too much time away from my family or not being able to do the things that I would like to do. Um, I think I would, you know, hurry up and go to the to the property management side. But um, you just start start out if you you know in the future if you're looking to go for a property manager, I would go ahead and start calculating those expenses in there as if you already had you know a property manager in place. So whenever you want to transition over, um, the numbers will still match up um, if you, if it could work like that. But for right now, me starting out small. Um, it was best that I, um, you know, just manage it myself just to uh, increase my cash flow. But eventually I will, you know, go over to the property management side. Okay, that makes sense. I wanted to uh, see what going on behind the scenes before I got a property manager as well, too, so I know what to look for. And, and you're going to be living in, in, in one of them, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that's going to help tremendously right just because you're there and you can see it happen and take care of things so that's that sounds pretty like a good way to go yeah, yeah you can be up close and personal <laughs> <laughs> you've got some really good property management companies in in the city limits too that i think it would be worth having a conversation with if that's the route you want to go um you do learn a lot when you manage for yourself though <laughs> good and bad so that nice smooth forehead might have some wrinkles on it if you if you uh, if you jump into this, but uh, no, it's it's uh it's really some really good people I would refer you to to talk to if you do think about property management. So, congrats, Jalen. Congrats, Samir. Floor is open, guys. What else is going on? Uh, see achievement properties in the background there. I love it. I love it. Samir, do you have any other multifamily already? Um, so we are investing in like as an LP in a few deals, but none that we're an active manager ourselves on. Yeah. Other thoughts, ideas? <clears throat> What's going on? Anybody got a deal they want to share? I see Kathy coming in the room. Good to see Josh Harms as well tonight. Um, tonight, quick thought, um, quick question. Uh, topic tonight is uh, like, what happens when you start buying assets versus liabilities? So I, I love the fact that most people in the room own some type of asset or in the process of buying an asset. Um, or at least interested in buying an asset, right? So what I wanna hear tonight, and I'd love everybody to participate, is like, how is buying an asset changing your life? Like how is buying assets instead of liabilities affecting your life? Um, what we're calling a liability is something that costs you money on a monthly basis, okay? So if, if, if it's costing you money, if, if it takes money out of your pocket, takes money from your business, takes money from your family, and you have to come up with the money, we're calling that a liability. Um, love that y'all are trickling in tonight. That's good. All right. So uh, what happens when you start buying assets? And for the purpose of assets tonight, we're, we're describing assets as something that is paid for by a customer right? Something that is paid for uh, by someone else and it's bringing income into your world, right? 
Um, so what happens? Anybody? Uh, let's start it off. Let's kick it off tonight. Uh, definitely want it to be an interactive session. So who wants to kick us off? Uh, maybe tell a story about the time you first bought an asset, something that's changed, but I'm going to be quiet and let y'all talk. I'll it. kick it off, man. I'll kick it off. Go for it. Hey, man. Uh, so um, I'll tell you just a quick story about me. And I've been investing for about 15 years, I guess. Uh, but 0809 happened, and everybody knows what happens 0809. The real estate market blew up. And um, in 0809, uh, I was heavy in the uh, flip market. I flipped a lot of properties. But at the time, those, those weren't assets no more, man. They were liabilities for me because I was covering the monthly payment every month. Um, and so in 0809 happened, uh, we had some properties that uh, basically went under and we had to sell them for whatever we could get for them. And actually we foreclosed on one of them uh, just because we couldn't sell. I mean, it was market prices were going down quicker than, um, than we could recoup. And so um, when I restructured and, and re got back into the real estate market, uh, I learned real quick that I had to have uh, assets cover those liabilities. And so what I've done slowly is I've built the uh, rental side and I do not buy a flip unless I have a property that will cover that monthly payment. And, um, and it, it makes the business turn so much easier for me. I'm not saying that's for everybody, but, uh, that is, that is how I run my business now. And so we, um, uh, we make sure that every flip we own, uh, we have a, a property that covers that. And if the market goes south, I, I've got that payment covered. I'm not working a job to cover that, that payment until I get that property sold. Um, so, uh, just a, a neat little, I mean, it's a story, but, uh, you know, it's how you buy it. And at the time I was buying four houses a month to, uh, rehab and, uh, you know, we weren't rehabbing, we were rehabbing probably, uh, two of those a month, you know, in turn and putting back market. But in, in 07, you could basically put a house in the market and have it sold in 20 days. And, um, uh, and, and then 08, 09 happened and we saw it coming, but we were too deep. We had too many properties. And so 08, 09 happened. And at that time we couldn't, uh, you can offload them and rents, rents were driving down because there was a ton of stuff on the market. Uh, so landlords that owned their houses free and clear or had less payments than I did, you know, they were, they were lowering the rent rates and my house payment was still $1,200 a month. I was still trying to get $1,200. Well, I was getting $1,400 a month rent off of it, but the next door neighbor had a house that he had had for 10 years before mine and his payment was $700 a month. So he's lowering his rent down to a thousand dollars a month and uh i couldn't rent them i couldn't do anything with them so yeah just just a story like that i mean it's uh it's, it was a mindset change for me and i had to i had to shift how i how i invested and uh uh you know uh, i thought i was buying properties as i thought they were going to be all assets and they end up being liabilities so yeah that's an important point like <clears throat> you know i'm i'm in several flips right now as well and until they generate income you know, they, they, they're not quite assets. Right. Um, so I like what you're doing. Actually, it's a good, good point for me to think about is you're, you're looking at your flip payment as something that needs to be covered by an asset until you sell it. Yep. And I think Dave Ramsey, right. Talks about how he got in the same trouble, right. Of, I know I mentioned his name is like sin, but, uh, <laughs> you know, he, he, he talks about how he, he went bankrupt because, he was doing that same thing. He had all these properties he was flipping and the payments just kind of got out of whack and, you know, he lost that, lost that first business. So Josh, thanks for sharing that story. I'm always very interested in hearing about people who went through the crash of 2008, because if you're like me and you started in 16 or 15 or 18, 19, like we haven't experienced that. So, you know, I've just experienced the up, up, up. And I like hearing about what, what was going on then. So thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Hey Josh, quick question. Yeah. Um, yep. I guess this might be market dependent, right? But um, I've noticed in, in some cases where like properties that are good flips are not good rentals, right? And that maybe that's just too general of a statement. Um, but in the cases where, you know, maybe the payment's just really high compared to the market rent rate, right? Do, do you not flip in those markets? How do you kind of deal with that? Um, I mean, 
we buy we buy for numbers now. Um, I'll be honest with you. I was young. Oh eight oh nine. I was I was buying on emotion a lot of times. Uh, it was kind of kind of the same market that we have right now, where people are getting beat out on prices and the, the new investors I see are are kind of. I, what scares me short-term rentals i mean i'll be completely honest with you I, I bought a lot on the coast and i see these people going and, and paying 750 800 000 for a house on a short-term rental and they've never bought anything before uh they're paying 50 60 000 over asking to get into them and thinking that the short-term rental is just going to be their savior and they're going to make twenty thousand dollars a month off this house um that that's not my that's not my my uh investing mm-hmm where I go now. So what I would, what I say with people is, is that if the numbers don't work, don't force the deal. I mean, it's just what it is. And, and, and honestly, where I got into trouble is it was the same. It was the same thing as, is now is, is that, you know, the Burr method, everybody's like, okay, buy refinance, pull as much you can out of it. I don't do that anymore. I try to leave that cushion. I, I like to leave 25% at least in my, in my properties. Um, and just because, yeah, there's some equity sitting there and I'm not saying that equity is, wouldn't be nice to have in my pocket sometimes, but at the same time, if the market does fluctuate as much as it did in 08, 09, you're still going to be covered. I mean, you're still going to be there. You might not make any money, but as long as your rental will cover that payment, you're just gonna have to wait it out. I was in the totally opposite. I was back then. If you could breathe and you could make a phone call, you could get a loan. I mean, literally no docs, nothing. I mean, it was just like okay hey look we're gonna give you a loan numbers look good let's make this happen and we were buying houses you know at uh you know 50 percent of, of retail value but the problem is by the time we got done with the flip they were like a hundred percent of whatever the 50 percent was you know so it got it got really dicey and uh and then nobody was buying because what happened is is the banks shut their doors i mean there was people that were they were calling loans due on stuff that we had that uh, basically, um, I, I don't need, I mean, it was like, they just called me up one day and said, Hey, you're 125,000 on this. And we want our money back. And I'm like, what the heck, what am I, how am I going to get 125,000? And that was actually the property we foreclosed on. And the crazy thing about it was it sold at the courthouse steps for $189,000. And I didn't get any of that money. And I only, I owed 140 on it. That's so, cool. but you could, that's hold- even, what's that? You couldn't hold it. No, no. So uh, basically what happened was, is that uh, my payment on it was 1189 a month and market market rent went down to like 750. So I was going to lose $350 a month off of it. Uh, we had a realtor that actually had it sold and uh, the real estate market, we went from, I lived in Beaufort, South Carolina, Charleston area is where I lived. This house was in Beaufort, South Carolina. We literally had, I think there was 500 realtors in 08 in 09, it went down to 132 realtors. I mean, they just like dropped like flies. Some of them moved out of state. Some of them moved out of the country. That my realtor became an English teacher in Africa. I mean, he just moved and became an English teacher in Africa. So they disappeared. And so we lost contacts. We lost contracts. We lost everything. And so, um, it, you know, the whole thing about it was, is that when the bank called me and said, hey, I need it. We need, we have 30, maybe 45 days to, uh, get this house sold or else we were calling the note, the note due. And I'm like, well, I don't even know what to do. I mean, nobody's buying my house, you know? And so we ended up foreclosing on that one. And uh, it was, it was a very humbling moment for me because first of all, I always paid my bills on time. I always did all the stuff, you know? And uh, at that time it was like, what, what do you do? We had missed one payment uh, on that, but it wasn't, we were current at the time, but we had missed one payment like six months before that, whenever the market had really just crashed, we couldn't even find anybody to rent it out. So, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I'm very skeptical where I buy now. I'm very, uh, um, I, I just, the numbers have to work for me and I just make sure that, uh, you know, it, it's just the number, it's a numbers game and not an emotion game anymore. So. I, love, I love how, how, you for those folks just coming on good to see you Talandra uh John Crutchfield Sr. is in the building good to see uh Richard uh Talandra good to see y'all if I miss somebody Jermaine good to see you come in Andre um I if you missed what he said he he said that he learned that his assets should be paying for his liabilities through this this downturn and now when he flips a house he makes sure that he has enough cash flow 
to pay for the payment that he has until that house gets flipped. Um, awesome, awesome, awesome strategy as well. So glad to hear that. One of the things that I learned um, from Josh and Samir's statement is that it's not crazy to actually wait on a deal. Like there are so many people right now that are buying at prices that don't make sense, right? Or that are too risky. And it's okay if you actually wait on a setup where you're doing a safe project, you're not gonna lose money, you're not gonna be stuck if the market turns, um, you know, and that's okay to, to actually wait on a project um, or to go create one, right? Uh, we don't wanna be complacent, but we don't have to do a deal with bad numbers. So Josh, thanks for sharing that. Um, hey, Tampa, hopefully you're doing well down there. Uh, hey, question. Yeah, Andy, go for it. Yes, Andy. Oh, I was going to pick back off what Josh said. Uh, years ago, a guy told us, uh, you know, you got to have exit strategies when you buy something. And don't go in with just one exit strategy. Because if you only have one, there's only one, one thing you can do, you know. So you got to be looking at it is if you buy a property and you're going to flip it, if things don't work out flipping, can you rent it out and make the payment? If not, then you've got to look at the deal differently. And the other thing was when he was talking about uh, foreclosures, he got lucky because the house sold for more than what he owed on it. I've had people in the real estate where they uh, got foreclosed on a property. Let's just say 200 was owed on the property and it sold for 150. The bank went ahead and sold it and they, they thought everything was okay. The very next year, they got a thing from the IRS that they now earned $50,000 of income that they never earned. They got to pay the tax bank, on, on the money they lost. The bank, gets to, the, bank gets to write, the bank gets to write it off. You get to pay for it. That's right. <laughs> so you really, and hey, look. Buying something too high at yeah. this time. You really have to watch what you're buying because if you get market turns on you and you can't handle it, that foreclosure can hurt you a lot more. Yeah, and Josh, in, in Josh's story, like his sold for hire, but he st he didn't even get any of it either. So, like, they keep it all; it's theirs. <laughs> hurt, hurt, hurt both ways. I, I think there's some been some laws passed since 2008 with the I think Dodd Frank and stuff, where the banks can no longer profit from a foreclosure. But still, I mean, it's 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 worth making sure that you have assets to pay for your liabilities. And Josh went deep right off hand, like talking about how a flip can be a liability. Um, so I want to open the floor back up. Like what happens when you buy assets instead of liabilities? That's the question tonight. Anybody else can chime in, jump in. I think one big thing is that you start connecting with other people who buy assets and not liabilities, right? <laughs> your, yes. your, your rooms like this for, you start surrounding yourself and meeting people who are, you know, in similar mindset, right? It's a mindset shift and it's a paradigm shift, I think, um, in a lot of ways. Look, when you're buying a used car or a new car and, and you got a payment, you're, you're so, you're usually your friends are all doing the same thing, right? Like, hey, I got a car and I, I got a payment on it. And, you know, man, that's cool. That's flashy. You know, when you're buying the boat on payments, most of your friends are doing the same stuff. You know, um, but when you're buying assets, a lot of times you gravitate towards people that understand that concept and you start meeting cool people and you're like, oh, there are other people that think like this too. Like I want a boat, I want a car, but I want an asset to pay for it. And until I get an asset paying for it, I'm gonna delay my gratification. So floor is open. Some other folks in here that have bought assets uh, what happens when you do that? Uh, I'll start calling some names. Y'all can start telling me. A lot of you all have assets. What happens when you start buying assets instead of liabilities? Your, um, your net worth goes up. Ooh. Also, like, like you said, your net worth. <laughs> Both of them. Yeah. So you're, so you're saying your net worth. You, you started talking about your net worth goes up. Net worth. Yeah, what until you, I start, until I got into the asset, I mean, to the real estate, I never, you know, really looked at the balance sheet or really knew what it was. 
And once I did, my personal income statement, you know, had a whole bunch of expenses, but nothing to go on the asset. Man, you said something there. So net worth starts to go up. Uh, man, if, if you never looked at your net worth before you bought assets, I mean, my the, the, the net worth is, is kind of fun to watch. It's fun to watch the asset column grow and the liability column go go down, right? That's all, that's always a good thing, especially when the asset column is paying for the liability side. Um, that's awesome. Uh, I want to keep the floor open. What what happens, y'all, when you buy assets instead of liabilities? Yes, I have a contribution. Go for uh, it, Bob. When you buy, yeah. When you buy an asset, you you delay gratification, like you you are uh, you delay the the privileges of life. Those are uh, uh, momentary enjoyment. You have to kind of uh, forfeit it for you to uh, buy an asset. And secondly, when you buy an, an asset, you are you are in a journey to financial freedom because of you know that you be more financially secured in the future to buy any uh, luxury you want. So that is the importance of buying an asset. And uh, also an, buying an asset helps you to also provide for others. Like when you buy uh, properties now, you are able to provide for your, your workers, your family, and the community or the church or any, any uh, group you belong to. So it gives you the opportunity to help uh, um, people. Uh -oh. But liabilities makes you not you took mine, Paul. Man, I used to be—I used to be so stingy, Paul. I used to—I used to—I think I told some people this story. My wife and I—we got married real young, so we had an excuse to do this. So don't judge me, okay? And I know we're on Facebook, so just put your comment below if you don't like what I'm about to say. But we used to—we used to go in restaurants, and, and we were young, but we used to look for a reason not to tip the waiter. Like we, we used to look for a reason to keep that money in our pockets. And we would leave the restaurant and be like, oh, she was too slow to come. Well, I'm, I'm going to say I used to do this because I'm not going to put this on my wife. She might run for president one day. So let me, let me, let's look. We used to look for a reason. I used to look for a reason not to tip the waiter. And it was trying to save money. But like Paul's right. When you start buying assets instead of liabilities, like you can bless your community, right? You can be more giving, more charitable. You can have an impact on your community in a positive way. And you start looking for ways to bless people because the liabilities are, I mean, the, the assets are providing you more, more resources, right? Um, so Paul, man, awesome, awesome, awesome uh, thing that happens. Uh, I love hearing that. All right, who else we got? What happens when you start buying assets over liabilities? Hey, Kent. How's it going? Man, good to see you, man. Likewise, so with assets and liabilities, Yes, we can take tangible pieces, but also as far as relationships. So I walk into a room yes, and people that I meet, you're either an asset or liability to me. Do you Ooh. bring value to the table or you're a cancer? So, so I'm, in a, I'm in the Air Force, been in this year 18 years. It's been going great. But the biggest thing I've learned was uh, like, for example, you go to places that suck, right? Yeah. So someone comes up to me and I'm, I ask them, okay, what's the solution to the problem? If you got a solution, let's make it happen. If not, um, you know, you got to leave my circle. So then they become a liability and I just cancel those liabilities out. But if you're an asset, you bring positivity to the table, not money. I'm not looking for money, right? But just positivity. You forge those relationships that later on compound over time. So... That is my take on assets and liabilities from a different perspective. Hey, look, Kent, I love it. I love it. And thank you for your service, man. We appreciate everything you're doing. Uh, man, like, as they say, that'll preach. That'll preach. Cancer versus positive giver of life. Um, and, and I would say that what happens, Kent, to add on to what you say, is that being an asset in that way as a person, building those relationships brings opportunity, right? Whether it's an opportunity to do more business, an opportunity to be more charitable, 
an opportunity to help more folks, right? Blessings flow to those types of assets, people that are positive, people that are are giving and loving. Um, I, I definitely have seen that. So thank you for sharing that as well. Great perspective. Yes, sir. Right. Yeah, man. What else y'all got? What happens when you start buying assets over liabilities? I think you're actually excited to go and check your bank accounts instead of just trying to hide away from them and pretending Ooh, like you don't have them. <laughs> yeah. You're actually excited about the first of the month, right? You're not, not oh, man. pretending like your bills are just, you know, not happen. Hey, I was a principal of a school, y'all. I'm being like totally transparent. I was making six figures a year plus, plus bonuses. And it was all going right out of the window. Like, you know, somebody says, oh, John, we've never seen you buy crazy stuff. Well, you know, at that time, like cars on payments, uh, the biggest house that we could afford within our budgets, uh, food, food right? Let's just buy food, restaurants, eating all the time, right? We still do a lot of that stuff now, but our assets are paying for those things, right? Our assets are paying for those liabilities. So we're not talking about a reduced quality of life. We're talking about making adjustments to when you take advantage of those things. You know, my son knows now, hey, look, uh, we were driving the other day and he saw a, he saw a nice Corvette Matter of fact, Andre Twine saw the same Corvette. So we were talking about the Corvette and he he has this thing right now where he wants to be an NFL player. So he's like, dad, I'm gonna be an NFL player and I'm gonna buy you that Corvette because it's beautiful. And I was like, how else could you buy me that Corvette? And when he said out of his mouth, like, ooh, I can buy some houses. I was like, oh yes, he's 10 years old. He got, he got it, right? Like that's the idea is that you're, you're not reducing your quality of life, you're just delaying gratification until you have an asset in place that can pay for it. So other thoughts, how, how did buying an asset change your life? Hey, Richard. I think, um, I think for um, assets, it actually gives you the power to leverage. So you could actually go ahead and, you know, use the bank's money or just stuff like that, just leveraging. I think when you have assets, you can leverage other people's um, value, I guess. If that's other, okay. other people's value, other people's money. Mm -hmm. Man, it's like having something to borrow against actually increases our ability to, to, to borrow, right? Yeah. You're not coming in with saying, hey, will you loan me some money and I don't have any collateral. Now you have collateral, right? And there's relationship capital collateral, there's relationship, capital, collateral, use that word, but there's also money, right? And having assets gives you something to say, well, I can put this up in exchange for this. I love it. I love it. I think that's what you're saying, Richard, and correct me if I'm... Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Awesome. Awesome. Hey, we're talking about this because we've got people that are just getting started. We've got people that are growing their portfolios, and sometimes it's good to think about... Um, what we're really doing, right? And I, I run a property management company. We, we manage a bunch of rental units. I don't even like saying the number anymore. It's growing every month. And my days can be pretty chaotic, right? A lot of times my team handles it. I have a great team. They handle a lot of the issues, day-to-day -day issues. But sometimes in the chaos, I have to stop and say, like, what am I actually doing? And what I'll do is I'll pull up a spreadsheet and start looking at my assets versus my liabilities. Ramon knows this because I'll send Ramon a text with a calculation and be like, what's this number? And he, he knows, like he'll get it. He'll be like, oh, that's how much you make when you're asleep, right? Like I have to do those things to stay entertained <laughs> and, and, and put up with some of the headaches. So this is important reflection. Um, what happens when you buy assets versus liabilities is that you're paid in multiple profit centers, right? I haven't heard anybody say this one yet, right? But when you start buying assets, you have the cash flow, but there's nothing like the peace of mind, right? There's no, there's nothing like the the tax benefits, right? Our tax system is structured where when you buy assets, you pay less taxes. Very interesting, you know? Um, so, Tax season just happened. Um, 
all of my buddies have multi-million dollar multi-family portfolios and we're texting each other like, okay, how much did you make? <laughs> how much did you pay in taxes? And if you've got rental properties, sometimes it's amazing at what it's doing for our tax rate, right? It's a great asset to shelter tax liability as well. Hey, I see in the chat, uh, oh, Kent's talking, Paul's talking. Feel free to type in chat too. If you're on Facebook, like jump in the room or come next week, but we wanna to talk to you. We're just talking real estate, nothing formal here. Uh, I wanna take a few more folks' comments. Uh, what happens when you start buying assets versus liabilities? I have one. Hey, Andre, go for it. Uh, I believe personally uh, when buying assets, it could lead to buying bigger assets, which creates uh, multiple streams of income. And that's that's what we are looking for as far as in if you want to buy art, uh, cryptocurrency, uh, just multiple things when uh, creating uh, multiple assets coming in. It, it leads to generational wealth as well. Generational wealth, generational wealth having something to leave to your children. One of my, one of my employees, uh, we laugh about this now. He, uh, y'all, when, when I met him two years ago, he's my age, right? So he's 35. He's been working for 15 years and has no 401k, no retirement of any kind. He's poured his heart into two different companies, worked for him for seven plus years, switched, worked for another one for seven plus years, no 401k, no savings right? He jumps into a real estate company and, you know, he's, of course, he's a millionaire now, right? And he's only done four projects, but his retirement picture has completely changed because he's buying assets versus what he was spending his money on before. And he still, he actually still has BMWs and, and stuff like that, but we talk about it differently. Now he has tenants paying for those things. All right, so it's, it's a really beneficial way to think. Um, of course, it's not for everybody, but folks in this room, it's probably it's probably for us. <laughs> I just wanna add something. I uh, just wanna say that assets put money in your pocket and liability take money out of your pocket. So just because you buy a rental property, it doesn't mean that it's necessarily an asset. You gotta make sure that the rental property put money in your pocket. So asset put money in your pocket, liability take money out of your pocket. Absolutely. Absolutely. I remember like, I remember when it clicked for me and I, I only have to, I can only speak from my perspective, but when it clicked for me is that for years I was trained in my brain to get paid on the first and the 15th state employee. Right. So I was trained to get paid on the first and the 15th. So what happens? I started thinking, okay, on the first, Ooh, I get to have some fun on the 15th. I get to have a little more fun. Right. But, you know, a lot of people understand this concept of running out of money before the month ends. And then I got a few rentals and I remember when it clicked, it, it wasn't the cash flow or the net profits. It was when people started paying me rent and I just had more money flowing through my account. Right. Just having more money floating through my account from a gross operating perspective open my eyes like oh man like I could actually not be broke at the end of the month and that is a great way to to think about this as well assets give you some flexibility um, I like to say that hey if I can't pay you today I can pay you tomorrow because more people owe me than I owe right and that's that's the the, the change in dynamic is having more people owe you than you owe so one of my pet peeves, one of my pet peeves is when I hear people talk about, uh, they talk about, you know, their rent increasing, or they talk about the gas going up, or they talk about the movie theater charging more, or they talk about the restaurants going higher. How about you own one of those or all of them? Like figure out how you can make yourself on that side of the table. Like how can you sit yourself or situate yourself as to be the one doing the rent increases or raising the prices. And of course we wanna be um, compassionate, right? And empathetic to like what's really going on. Cause there's a lot of people being affected by these, these price increases.
But a lot of us are situated, we have time <laughs> to build assets that can help shelter us from those effects. Okay, so um, I'm gonna be quiet now because I said we're gonna talk interactive. Floor is open. Uh, what else y'all wanna talk about? What happens when you buy assets over liabilities? We're gonna wrap up tonight, but I just wanted to, to have this, this conversation. Uh, but hey, floor is open. What else y'all wanna talk about on this subject or any other, maybe you had a burning question you wanted to ask somebody in the group this week. Jaron, you might have to remind me who you are if you wanna say hello to folks. Uh, say hello to folks. I, I see an iPhone here too, if you wanna say hello to folks. Uh, I wanna leave floor open. We got about 10 more minutes. Hey, yes, my, my name is Jaron Gavan, and I think I've come maybe a couple of weeks. So I got invited by Mr. Andy. And like I told you a couple of weeks ago, I just like to get on here and just pick up knowledge. I'm a 23-year-old banker, fresh Ooh. out of college, trying to figure out, you know, how I can buy more assets. And so try, just to kind of piggyback off of what you just said, you know, it's funny that you said, you know, you, you hear people complain about oh, gas went up or this, that, and the other, but if you get the right assets then inevitably if your assets are higher than your liabilities you'll be able to live forward and i think that that's the definition of wealth because you're you're allowing yourself to have more ahead of you than you have in the current moment so when you have these assets that are stacking like you're saying that are building that are generating more income than your liabilities and there's no way for you not to get ahead and not to be able to you know, um, sustain through any situation that the, you know, the, the economy has at that given point in time. So it just allows you to, to live forward. So I feel like that's what, that's what it really kind of boils down to. Man, if I could have made the statement you just made at 23, oh my, oh my, I, I would be going after, I would be going after Twitter right now. <laughs> so, hey, you're on the right track, man. Like start buying them. If you've already buying them, keep buying them. Uh, figure out how to make, and, and there's so many things that you can make assets. I did want to to remind folks of that. There's so many things that you can make assets, like even before you can buy a house or buy apartments or buy commercial property. Like some of us figured this out really early, right? But like subleasing your apartment changes the game, right? Ride sharing changes the game. There's so many things you can do to change that column of, hey, this comes out of my pocket every month to this provides me income every month. Um, and Jaron, man, hey, good luck to you. Keep coming, keep coming. Find the deal so we can do it. Um, what else we got, guys? What else is going on? There's a good book, uh, if you, people haven't read it or if you're starting off that I recommend that started for me back in 2010, uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, if no one's read it. Uh, it's real easy read, but it breaks it down uh, clearly with assets and liabilities. Me personally, I'm not into multi or I don't have any multifamily deals, but I've been in stocks for a hot minute. Um, and now I'm transitioning over to multifamily. But that book, though, it's amazing. It's a game changer. Yeah. Say it one more time so I can put it in the chat. Uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki. Yes, sir. Yeah, that was a good one. I like how it's written in kind of a like a story format because it helped me helped me a lot. You know, some books are kind of uh, jargony, but his 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 book makes you think a little bit. And then I'm reading right now the Multifamily Millionaire by Brandon Turner, the Volume One and Volume Two. That one's I'm learning a lot about the multifamily. That's a good one, and it's a step by step too, right? Like it helps you yep. think about your process that you're gonna go go into after after buying and Jalen is like starting that process right now. So go Jalen, four unit yep. in the house, um, four unit in the house. What else we got? What happens when you start buying assets, liabilities versus liabilities? I want to ask the group, has anybody had a, something that they thought was an asset? And I think Josh, you kind of, you kind of mentioned this is you thought it was an asset, but really was a liability. How did you recover and how, what did you, pivot to? Um, so, kind of, so kind of starting out, uh, I always thought, you know, credit cards was a, a liability. Um, but if you 
you be responsible and uh, you know learn how to use them properly to your advantage, they can uh, become an asset as well. Mm. I love it. I love it. I think mine would be, uh, you know, like just remembering that your business is only an asset if you have people in your life that want you to that you can enjoy it with, right? So, like. You can build this big business that's making money, but if you have nobody at home, <laughs> or if if that's what you want, right? It depends on what you what you want in life. But I I, I I wanted my wife and kids to actually know who I was, right? So making sure that you know I put employees in place to manage some things rather than me trying to do everything so that I can spend that time at my daughter's art recital or my son's basketball game, and that 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 asset of a business or a real estate company doesn't turn into a liability for, for the relationships that are important to me. So I'm still learning that it's an active process. <laughs> right. Initially everybody think of, well, I think about cars, but now with Uber and Lyft and everything, you can actually turn your car as Turo um, into an asset. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a way of life. It's like, um, you know, I, I, so in the last couple of months, I bought a few lake houses, right? And it's, it's not because like people see me say, I post that I buy a lake house, right? It has nothing to do with me, like being able to afford these things or me being able to live this lifestyle. Like it's actually because I'm figuring out how much money we can make to pay for them. If, if my family happens to stay in them for a week, a, a week, a year, it's being paid for by other people's income, right? Other people enjoying uh, enjoying that asset as well. So just so many ways that we can monetize uh, things that we, we want to do or experiences that we want to have. Uh, Dr. Joe Vitale, yes, the secret to attracting money. That is a, that is a good one too. Um, hey y'all, this is good tonight. I, I'm, I, I'm uh, going to cut it short here. Uh, it's seven o'clock. We usually go till, till seven o'clock uh, central time. But this is good, like thinking about this with y'all and y'all interacting tonight has been helpful. I'm in the South, so we say y'all. Um, if you want to get involved, here's a plug. I have an absolutely free challenge, free challenge that is in the group. It's posted in the group newsfeed, right? This 30-day challenge is already started May 1st. We challenge the group to raise $20,000 of money that they didn't have before the month started uh, and to um, find a deal, something that they could flip for at least two grand. That's it. Anything you could flip for at least two grand. That's the challenge this month. Um, we're going to be posting about it pretty actively during the month. Don't forget, you can reach out to my team. You can reach out to me on Facebook. Uh, if you need some help with this, we are doing this completely free, but we want people to find a deal or find some money this month so that we can grow our businesses. Like Jalen is already on it and I hope this contract comes through. That's awesome, that's amazing. Uh, I, I love it. So anybody else having any progress with the challenge right offhand? We got two minutes left. Uh, I know we've got some folks in the room that, jo that joined the challenge. So anybody having some success right offhand to give people some energy who may be on the fence about doing it? Anybody? Okay, well, you got till next week. <laughs> find some money, find some deals, check out the PowerPoint, it's in the news feed. So if you're looking for strategies, there's some, some suggestions there. Um, if you follow that challenge, if you commit to doing this for this month, I'm sure you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna accomplish your goals, you're gonna, you're gonna move forward. So very good having everybody tonight. Uh, if I can help y'all in any way, reach out. Other than that, y'all have a great night. Thank you. You too. Hey, thank y'all. Thanks, everyone. All right. Bye, y'all.